Brad TRT for Warriors coming at you with a new video. Dr. Abe Morgenthaler versus your doctor. So there's a brand new concern now about uh, uh, a new risk for testosterone therapy, which is cardiovascular risk. What's really interesting about this is that for the last 20 years, there had been a growing and pretty substantial body of evidence indicating that testosterone was beneficial in terms of mortality and also in terms of some of the known risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So for example, we know that testosterone therapy reduces fat mass, increases lean mass, improves glycemic control, reduces waist circumference, all of which should be beneficial in terms of cardiovascular risk. And we have several studies that have shown that low levels of testosterone are associated with increased mortality, increased incidence of coronary artery disease, increased severity of coronary artery disease. And so it was rather strange when in November 2013 appeared a journal article published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that suggested that there was increased cardiovascular risks with testosterone. Important to note that that study was a retrospective study, and we always have to be cautious with those. What that study, uh, written by Vegan and colleagues, uh, reportedly showed was that the absolute risk of stroke, heart attacks, and death in men who took testosterone was increased compared to men who were untreated but also had low levels of testosterone. In fact, the authors made an <laughs> error, and this was subsequently pointed out, and the paper was changed, but not until the damage was done and the headlines were made. In fact, what the actual absolute rate of events showed, an absolute rate of events refers to what really happened, number of bad events divided by the number of people in that group, what it showed is that the rate of adverse events for heart attack, stroke, and death was 21.2% in the untreated group and only 10.1% in the testosterone group. In other words, the testosterone group had less than half the rate of adverse events, and yet the headline appeared to be <laughs> So this study had other problems as well, including after the fact they discovered that nearly 10% of the all-male population turned out to be female. So a number of medical organizations and many oh, no. uh, individuals okay. in the field yeah. have actually called for that article to be retracted, uh, which has not happened, but retracted on the basis of the data no longer being credible. Since the publication of that study and another retrospective study that also asserted some increased risk, we now have something on the order of 16 subsequent studies, not one of which has shown increased cardiovascular risk, and several of which have shown substantial benefits of having either uh, an endogenous or naturally occurring higher level of testosterone, just naturally, or with testosterone therapy. The most interesting of those is a paper by Sharma and co-workers, where they looked at over 80,000 individuals, retrospective again, but they had three groups. Uh, one was a group of men with low testosterone who were treated and their testosterone levels normalized. Another was a group that got testosterone treatment, but their levels failed to normalize. They still remained low. And a third was an untreated group. The best results were seen in the men who were treated with testosterone and their levels normalized when compared to the men whose levels did not normalize oh, or even untreated men. There we are. The mortality rate was reduced again by about half heart attack rate was down, and stroke rate was down. Rather remarkable study, suggesting that just applying testosterone may not be enough, but actually we need to actually get adequate treatment as evidenced by an increase in the blood levels. So I think... Hashtag optimization. I need one of those, uh, the lights through the eyes, enlightenment uh, on uh, Dr. Morgenthauer right here. Yeah, optimization is the uh, the name of the game. And uh, what that proves is that, so when you have a longitudinal, well, it's retrospective, so it's not longitudinal, but when you have a large people group and that, that trial then produces a vast amount of people, what it means is that the 700 to um, 2,000 
testosterone group where you're going to have 30 to 70 free testosterone is going to be healthier, safer, not have deaths. <laughs> Whereas if you're below the optimization number, you're going to have deaths. It's pretty straightforward. Today, the evidence accumulated over now for several decades is a fairly rich literature that is not yet definitive, but is strongly suggestive that if anything, testosterone may be beneficial for cardiovascular risk. Nonetheless, uh, the regulatory agencies in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration, did issue a warning, but a fairly cautiously worded one saying, as they often do, there may be increased risks or there are reports of it. The European Medicines Agency looked at all the same data and declined to add a warning. Um, and as a clinician myself, I think that we have to go with the best evidence that's available. Things that make sense usually make sense. We know that testosterone improves lean mass, <laughs> decreases fat mass, decreases waist circumference, improves glycemic control. And to me, it seems relatively straightforward that none of that should be associated with an increased risk. And maybe what we'd like to find out with a large study is that there possibly is even a beneficial effect that is yet to be shown in a hard, objective way. I'm Abraham Morgenthaler. I'm an associate clinical professor at Harvard Medical School and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and also the director and founder of Men's Health uh, Boston. I'm here to talk today about our paper that's coming out in Mayo Clinic Proceedings. The fundamental concepts regarding testosterone deficiency and treatment and international expert consensus resolutions. What we did here is we pulled together 18 experts uh, from four continents and 11 countries in the fields of urology, andrology, endocrinology, diabetology, internal medicine, and basic science. All the individuals on this panel had either extensive research or clinical experience with testosterone, and we focused on nine fundamental concepts in an attempt to see if we could find consensus. The meeting was held in Prague in the Czech Republic on October 1st, 2015, uh, under the aegis of the International Society for the Study of the Aging Male and sponsored also by King's College uh, London. Um, we invited the FDA as well as the European oh, Medicines Agency to participate because several of these concerns uh, that have appeared in the media and in medical literature have actually been generated by these regulatory uh, agencies. Uh, the FDA declined, but the European Medicines Agency did um, uh, allow a participant uh, who participated in a non-voting uh, capacity. The meeting was organized around nine resolutions, and how uh, we organized this was that there was a presenter who presented the science to everyone at the meeting. Uh, there was a discussant who then provided an alternative uh, or uh, additional views. And then uh, the resolution itself was then opened up uh, for general discussion. We had vigorous debate on the wording of each of these resolutions. And in the end, after having changed uh, the wording of several of these in response to uh, points and comments made during our uh, discussions, in the end, we had unanimous agreement on all of these. The nine resolutions that we discussed ranged from the fact that testosterone deficiency is an important medical uh, condition that affects male sexuality, reproduction, general health, and well-being. We continued on to the testosterone deficiency as a global health concern. And we addressed other issues such as whether or not testosterone therapy is associated with increased risk of prostate cancer and cardiovascular disease, and we concluded that it was not for either one. We also looked at several controversial or topical issues, such as whether one needs to have an identified etiology uh, or cause of testosterone deficiency in order to merit treatment. This is a concept that has been put forth by the FDA. Our exactly. group found no evidence to support this, 
and as the cause of the symptoms and the manifestations of testosterone deficiency come from the decline in testosterone itself regardless of what the underlying etiology that may be. Another issue that I would just comment on here uh, since our time is short is the idea of having a cut point or a threshold at which point one should not treat men due to age. And it was our conclusion that there was no evidence to support this, that older men appear to respond just as well to testosterone therapy as do younger men. The fact that we that were able to get unanimous fuck. agreement from just such not a treating broad, people because they're old, like uh, Jesus group Christ, of experts, that's insanity, uh, is very important because what it speaks to is that uh, physicians and researchers, all of whom had extensive clinical and research experience with testosterone deficiency and its treatment, could agree on several fundamental concepts. And although one would never want to say that there are no areas of dispute within the field, of course there are, but these fundamental concepts, including several that are controversial, were not controversial for this group. In addition, in this article, our group addresses several of the commonly raised uh, concerns about testosterone therapy. These include comments such as testosterone therapy is investigational or experimental, that the symptoms do not merit treatment, that the testosterone deficiency occurs as a normal part of aging and therefore doesn't merit treatment, and even that the condition of testosterone deficiency or low T doesn't exist. Uh, our international panel found no evidence to support any of these <laughs> concepts. <laughs> Low testosterone is a well-established condition that has been documented in medical textbooks going on for generations. Testosterone therapy has risks, as do all medical treatments, but to call it risky, I think, is an unfair overall assessment. And finally, in terms of age, uh, we treat a whole variety of age-related conditions in medicine, including cardiovascular disease, uh, pulmonary disease, diabetes, hypertension, um, poor vision, poor hearing, arthritis, and even cancer. And the idea that just because something becomes more prevalent as we get older is not by itself a reason to not treat it. We found that the testosterone therapy is an important treatment for men who have the condition of testosterone deficiency. Speaking on behalf of this very distinguished international scientific uh, expert consensus panel. Our goal here was to actually address the fundamental concepts of this field to lay down a foundation on which further research and discussions can take place. We believe that by presenting the scientific evidence uh, to the public and to the medical community uh, that we can move forward in a way uh, that will help our patients and also help the research. We hope you found this presentation well, super the of the Mayo Clinic proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayocliniceproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research. Interesting. So that's a uh, pretty important uh, video by uh, Dr. Morgenthaler. And putting everything together in a context of you have a general consensus of national top leaders. You have um, a body of knowledge that extends beyond... Um, just the interventional side, but the 
um, longitudinal studies, and then you have your meta-analysis of those uh, 80,000 different studies that have been conducted. And that also the conclusion is that uh, normalization or optimization is where you have to go, meaning that it's not a particular number that a person needs to be at. There is no magical O between 500 and 700. No, it's not how it works. And if any doctor says that that's how it works, find another doctor because they don't understand how optimization and it's a personal number for the individual. Um, there is no verified, oh, if you're at this number, you're healthy, and oh, if you're not at this number, then you're not, right? It's, it's a gray area in terms of how you feel, what personal side effects that you have, can you deal with the side effects maybe that you have and you want to go higher, that sort of thing, and you have to work that out with your doctor. Um, it's pretty important in terms of how you look at getting your treatment that you find the right type of doctor who is able to assist you in working on optimization. So meaning that you may start with your general practitioner, but you may want to work with an expert or something that I've been um, promoting as well is that maybe you pay a TRT clinic a consult fee per year and then you have them create a protocol for you and then work with your general practitioner to implement that it's a little bit you know on the on the fence in terms of if that'll work for you individually but it's a way to keep costs down um, and if you have a doctor who's willing to learn as well then it's an opportunity for you to get really good treatment and then um, you know be able to uh, utilize that protocol um, that they would do just by using your own personal doctor. But um, the first step should always be um, getting optimized first, getting dialed in. And what that means is basically you work with a TRT clinic, you go with that clinic, you find out what your dose is, you work on that, you get optimized and you find out what your particular dosage is. And then once you're completely dialed in, then you can transfer off to a different doctor or whatnot. But the strategy should always be getting optimized first because then you know exactly what you need to do, you know exactly your dose, exactly your symptoms, and you had to describe it to another doctor. So even if they're on the fence, they just don't want to deal with it or they're not comfortable with it um, you still have another doctor to bounce off of and you might be able to find someone else to work with um, that might be in your price range or maybe it's closer or once uh, the COVID restrictions come off in terms of medical care and they may decide to not allow doctors to prescribe nationwide that you might find a doctor that's close to you and you say hey this is my dose this is what I'm doing this is what I stay at I don't want to change the side effects of coming down or changing things is too heavy and if they're willing they work with you and if not then you just find somebody who is um, that's the main strategy that you have to work with but it's after you're dialed in and there's a lot of issues that can happen if you don't work with the right type of doctor who is trained knowledgeable and knows how to work the hormone cascade because your general doctor normally doesn't know how to work the cascade from cholesterol all the way down to pregnenolone, testosterone, and everything that comes off of that. This is Brad from TRT for Warriors, and I hope you guys have an awesome spring. Feel free to join the TRT for Warriors group on Facebook, and throw any comments my way that way. That's the preferred method. I will talk to you guys later.